don't underestimate the French military. Any discussion of a nation's reputation in warfare will almost inevitably lead to derogatory remarks directed towards the French. Their military exploits are the punchline of countless jokes, memes, and other disparaging comments, lampooning them as cowards or inept on the battlefield. The reality, however, is much different. Throughout its long history, the French nation has had an extensive and distinguished record of military triumphs, dating back as far as the early Middle Ages. In actual fact, for millennia, French soldiers have fought and died with courage, skill, and distinction. The story of French military history begins in the wake of the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. The Franks, a Germanic tribe from further east, pushed westward into what is now France. And under the reign of King Clovis I, the land in the Pyrenees in the southwest, the Alps in the southeast, and the Rhine River in the east was also secured. Though these borders would shift countless times over the intervening centuries, the rough area of French territory had been established. Clovis' descendant, Charles Martel, played an integral role in world history. In 732 AD, he and his Frankish army prevented the Arab Umayyad dynasty advance into France, inflicting a crushing defeat on their enemies at the Battle of Tours. With this victory, the ever-rising tide of Islamic expansion into Europe was halted. Throughout the Middle Ages, French forces fought in numerous wars against other European powers. Most extensive campaigns were against the English. During a series of conflicts now known as the Hundred Years' War, the French would suffer significant defeats at several battles, including Crecy, Poitiers, and Agincourt, and would later see much of their land devastated by English raids. In spite of these setbacks, the latter portion of the conflict saw the French drive the English from their lands on the continent. As the Middle Ages gave way to the early modern era, the French army, under the reign of Louis XIV, became the largest and most powerful in Europe, almost 400,000 strong. This force pioneered many advancements in military innovation, including logistical and support systems, field hospitals, and the introduction of standardized uniforms to its soldiers. The French military record during the early modern era is mixed, with both victories and defeats, but no more so than any other contemporary nation. It was during the late 18th and early 19th centuries when the French reached their zenith of military strength. Under the leadership of Napoleon Bonaparte, French armies marched across Europe, smashing rival powers at the decisive battles such as Marengo and Austerlitz. Defeats were caused by weather and logistical issues, such as the campaign against Russia in 1812, or by superior enemy tactics, such as Napoleon's final defeat at Waterloo in 1815. During this time, the abilities or courage of the individual French soldier was never in doubt. A century later, French soldiers found themselves embroiled in one of their most tragic military campaigns. The First World War introduced mass slaughter on an industrial scale, and France found itself in the middle of the conflict, with the majority of the fighting on the Western Front taking place on French soil. Vast areas of the French countryside were transformed into a shell-cratered hellscape, one in which millions of men were trapped for years. During this tumultuous time, French soldiers bore the brunt of the carnage, suffering titanic casualties. In the first two months of the war, over 300,000 French were killed, a number that would swell to half a million by the end of 1914. There was no battle as bloody, or one which exemplified the tenacity and courage of France's military, than the Battle of Verdun. In 1916, German General Erich von Falkenhayn launched an offensive aimed at the city of Verdun allowing such a strategically and symbolically important location to fall into enemy hands was unacceptable to French high command, and under the direction of Marshal Philippe Pétain, Verdun was reinforced. Their battle cry at the onset of this fight was On ne passe pas, or They shall not pass. The battle devolved into a grinding stalemate, with both sides dug in, stubbornly refusing to surrender. Over 40 million artillery shells were fired during the fighting. By the end of the 303rd day, 162,000 French soldiers had lost their lives with another 377,000 wounded, missing, or captured. True to their word, the French held their positions, and the Germans didn't pass those French positions. 
In the face of these and other monumental losses, the French military did in fact mutiny during the First World War. Strangely enough, however, they didn't lay down their arms. These men stayed in their trenches and continued to resist the Germans, but refused to participate in futile attacks against the heavily entrenched enemy positions. In the words of one group of mutineers, You have nothing to fear. We are prepared to man the trenches. We will do our duty and the Germans will not get through. But we will not take part in attacks which will result in nothing but useless casualties. Even when mutineering, French soldiers were still willing to lay down their lives for their nation. By the end of the war, over one and a half million Frenchmen lay dead with millions more wounded, though estimates vary. Roughly 18% of those who served in the ranks were killed, effectively wiping out a generation of young men. Yet in spite of these catastrophic losses, they still held firm against repeated enemy offensives. It was a generation later that France would earn its reputation as an inept military power, but this is far from the truth. After the outbreak of the Second World War, France and Britain declared war on Germany. After finishing off Poland, the Wehrmacht turned its attention west, breaking through the Low Countries and driving into France to circumvent the Maginot Line, a formidable series of defenses that ended at the Belgian border. The oversight by French high command, as well as advances in fast-moving maneuver warfare, caught the Allies off guard, and France was overrun in six weeks, an astonishing feat by any military standard. It was due to this fast capitulation that France gained an undeserved reputation as a nation of cowards with an incompetent military. This, however, is not a fair assessment. Other powers struggled against the German war machine, but had other advantages that France lacked. France didn't have the protection of the high seas enjoyed by Britain or the vast landmass of the Soviet Union and were overrun in short order. Even when defeated, the French people still fought on, both in exile and as partisans. The French resistance played a vital role in frustrating German plans on the Western Front. Their sabotage, assassination, and intelligence gathering operations were a key component in the success of the D-Day landings in 1944. To this day, the French resistance is seen as the symbolic representation of all resistance movements. After the Second World War, France was involved in many conflicts around the world, particularly in former colonies such as Indochina and Algeria. During the Global War on Terror, the French military provided support in the US-led invasion of Afghanistan. In addition, French air power effectively enforced no-fly zones over Libya, which allowed rebels to overthrow the dictator Muammar Gaddafi. French forces have also been at the forefront of anti-terror operations in other parts of Africa. They are currently the only NATO nation to participate in Operation Barkhane, which combated militants in West Africa. Currently around 3,000 French soldiers are stationed in Chad, the Ivory Coast, Mali, and other nations. One of the reasons for France's poor reputation can be attributed to their methods in these low-intensity conflicts. While most other nations use a more flashy shock and awe approach to combating terrorism and insurgency, France employs a more subtle strategy. In 2007, in order to stop an incursion of rebel forces in the Central African Republic, France sent two waves of paratroopers and a single fighter jet to halt the advance. No more than a few dozen were involved, and the French press didn't pick up the story until weeks after. It's this precision approach that lacks the same fanfare of other nations, which helps contribute to the popular conception of France as lacking military ability. Throughout the long history of their nation, the French have had military successes and failures, but no more or less than any other nations. Their reputation as a nation of cowards who surrender at the slightest provocation is not only unfounded, but based on biases and misconceptions that don't take into account the countless acts of bravery and martial success of the French people. Did Polish cavalry charge at tanks in World War II? During the invasion of Poland in 1939, it is said that Polish cavalry units charged at the German tanks with sabers and lances in a desperate and foolhardy attempt to take on the metal beasts. This is in fact a myth. 
The myth goes back to September 1, 1939, during the Battle of Kroyanti on the first day of the invasion. During this time, Polish cavalry, which made up 10% of its army, would use their horses for mobility on the battlefield to get from A to B quickly to reinforce infantry and then dismount to fight on foot. Near Kroyanti Pomeranian in northern Poland, the 18th Pomeranian Ulan Regiment under Colonel Mastalesz was ordered to repel the Germans from a key railroad junction in the Tuchola Forest at all costs, covering the retreat of Polish units in the area. The tankettes and infantry at his disposal were left in reserve to hold their existing positions. In the evening, with two Lancer squadrons, Colonel Mastalesz saw German infantry in the clearing and decided that a surprise cavalry charge could be used. All of a sudden, the Polish cavalry emerged from the woods and charged with sabers and lances towards the unprepared German infantry, successfully dispersing them. However, once the Polish cavalry occupied the clearing, German armored cars moved onto their position and opened fire on the horsemen, causing devastating casualties and causing those that could to gallop for cover. Eugeniusz Szwiszczak, commander of the 1st Squadron, who had led the charge, was killed in the fire, as was Colonel Mastalesz, who tried to save him. A third of the Polish horsemen were killed or wounded. This would be known as the Charge at Kroyanti. The next day, two Italian war correspondents witnessed the corpses of the mowed-down Polish cavalry. German tanks were now present in the area. They wrote an article about how the brave Polish cavalry had charged at German tanks. This myth was soon used by Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union for propaganda purposes to portray their Polish enemy as using outdated tactics and its commanders as foolishly wasting the lives of their men. They also used the charge as a way to show the might of their own weapons. For example, the German press suggested that the Polish cavalry believed the German tanks were dummy tanks or were lightly armored. The Polish army, while lacking in tanks, had the WZ-35 anti-tank rifle, which was capable of penetrating the armor of German panzers 1s and 2s. As well as this, the German and Soviet armies used cavalry to a large extent as well. Following the charge at Kroyanti, there were further Polish cavalry charges during the Polish September campaign and beyond, with the last Polish cavalry charge of World War II during the Battle of Schoenfeld in 1945. Eight things people get wrong about the U.S. military. Attention, soldiers. There are six branches of the U.S. military, and each and every one has popular myths surrounding it. Thanks, film and television. But is it true that you can run away and enlist in the Army? And how often do you really have to drop and give him 20? Turns out, we've got a lot wrong about how the U.S. military works. Number one, all veterans have dangerous PTSD. Sadly, studies have shown that of all the Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans, those displaying PTSD make up at the lowest 13.5% and at the highest 20-30% to of personnel. There is an unfortunate stereotype that these veterans are prone to outbursts of violence as survivors of PTSD. In fact, in a 2021 survey of 2,000 Americans, 26% believe that people with PTSD must be violent or dangerous. But this view of PTSD has been exaggerated by the media, leaving the average person to believe anyone who comes back from war is a firecracker waiting to go off. Although it can be a symptom of the illness, it's a myth that PTSD automatically equals a violent person. The overwhelming majority of people with PTSD live regular day-to-day -day lives upon returning home and do not harm others. Number two, enlisting is easy. There are plenty of TV shows and movies where the troubled young kid runs away and enlists in the army, disappearing from his family seemingly overnight. But this is incorrect. It's nowhere near as easy to join the military as the media makes it out to be. No branch of the armed forces will take someone without at least a high school diploma or possibly a GED. And depending on the branch of the military you want to go into, there can be some strict requirements. Officer positions are competitive and require at least a college degree, although many actually also have a post-grad certification. In the Coast Guard, you can't have more than three dependents, and in the U.S. Air Force, you must be a certain height, weight, and vision, among other requirements. But there are five pieces of criteria you must meet no matter which branch of the military you're interested in joining. Number one, we've covered. You need a high school diploma. The rest are Number two, be a full citizen of the United States or a resident alien. Number three, be at least 17 years old. Number four, pass a medical exam. 
Number five, pass the ASVAB. ASVAB stands for the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery Test and is part of its own myth. Number three, the ASVAB isn't important. The ASVAB is a test that assesses your mathematical reasoning, understanding of mechanics and science, word knowledge, as well as your ability to assemble objects. No matter what part of the military you're interested in, you will take this test. But some people believe the ASVAB doesn't matter and that you can get into the U.S. military without passing this crucial exam. This is not true. Every branch of the U.S. military requires a passing grade in this test, although what that score is varies from branch to branch, with the U.S. Air Force having the highest score requirements to join. Number four, the drill sergeant will drill you into the ground. Drop and give me 20. Thanks to television and movies, we believe that training is brutal, with a sergeant continually screaming in your ear, forcing you into back-breaking amounts of exercise and the punishment of cleaning the entire mess hall with a toothbrush. But while this may have at one time been true, this is not an accurate representation of the military and its trainers today. The U.S. military has now banned hazing in any form and has a zero-tolerance policy for those caught doing it. Although it may still take place, it is no longer encouraged or officially sanctioned. Instead, the U.S. Army calls it fundamentally in opposition to military values, and drill instructors can no longer treat recruits however they may like. Under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, they state, derogatory terms, excessive physical activities, and any abusive or violent contact are now forbidden, and those caught can face severe punishment. Number five, the pay in the military is low. Many people believe that those in the military are extremely low paid public servants who struggle with their salaries. But like any other job or industry, pay can vary dramatically in the US military. The base pay for new army recruits who have been in service for under two years is lower at $21,999. But this increases with length of service. Four-star generals who have been in the military for 20-plus years are able to earn a much larger $203,698 per year. And depending on the state and military branch, they may also only be taxed on their base pay, with all extra income their own to keep. Plus, those in the Army are able to stretch their pay further than other professions, with additional compensation and benefits, such as providing bonuses for food, health, housing, higher education, as well as being given 30 annual vacation days. Army service can help soldiers pay for college with the post-9-11 GI Bill program, for example, providing steep discounts on tuition, as well as bonuses for accommodation and books. Depending on the length of service, the program can cover some or even all of one's public college fees and for private and foreign college tuition, up to $25,000 annually. Number six, everyone in the military has seen active combat. With troops fighting in the Middle East and stories of active combat on the news, many people believe that everyone in the military goes to war. But the U.S. military is a huge operation, and there are plenty of career paths and roles that have nothing to do with fighting overseas. For example, you could become a programmer, administrator, civil engineer, or psychiatrist, among many other options. And the newest branch of the U.S. military has nothing at all to do with combat. Called the U.S. Space Force, it was established in 2019 as the world's only independent space force. Their concern is dealing with the aliens if they ever beam down. Number seven, the Army is where socioeconomically disadvantaged people turn. Across the U.S., there are many people who believe that the Army is usually somewhere people with few options for jobs or money turn. It's believed to be a main choice for socioeconomically disadvantaged individuals in search of a better life, but the actual makeup of the military does not match this belief. A study in 2020 showed that a diverse range of people are attracted to a military career path and that the poorest and wealthiest communities are actually underrepresented, with the majority of recruits coming from middle-class backgrounds. An earlier study concurred, showing that most recruits are actually wealthier, more educated, and more rural than most 18 to 24-year-olds. Number 8. Soldiers Shoot to Kill an active war zone is a horrible place, and it's always assumed that if a weapon is being fired, then it is fired with one intent, to kill the enemy. And while it's true that today's military personnel go through extensive dehumanization of the enemy training, the psychological impact of killing another human being means it's very likely that few soldiers are actually willing to shoot with the intention of killing. 
Studies into this phenomenon have been inconclusive and conflicting on the actual percentage of soldiers willing to shoot to kill, but there has been corroborating evidence that the number is not as high as you may expect and varies from battle to battle, war zone to war zone. Overall, there is a lot of misinformation and misconceptions about the United States military and what it entails. These are just some of the most common myths that you hear every day. So now you know the truth. When are you signing up, soldier? For many years, a legend grew that during World War I, a battalion charging towards a woodland had vanished into a mysterious mist and not one soldier had come back. They had simply all disappeared. But what really happened? The Vanished Battalion of Gallipoli While the Ottoman Empire was in such turmoil, the Allied forces decided that it would be the right time to launch a devastating and decisive attack against them to cripple their war effort. The Allies came up with a most daring plan that called for a massive amphibious invasion of the strategically important Gallipoli Peninsula near the Ottoman capital of Constantinople. If the Allies could gain supremacy over this region, they would control the vital shipping lanes from the Mediterranean to the Black Sea. They would also expose the Ottoman capital to naval bombardment by Allied battleships. On February 19, 1915, a large British-French task force commenced an attack on the Ottoman coastal artillery batteries. They were led by the newly commissioned British super dreadnought, the HMS Queen Elizabeth, the flagship of the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force that commanded all of the Allied forces during the Gallipoli campaign. The plan called for the task force to use spotter planes from the British seaplane carrier, the HMS Ark Royal, to help direct a devastating naval barrage. But this plan was severely hampered by bad weather, so the bombardment was largely ineffective in neutralizing the Ottoman's forts in the area. It was not until the end of February, after over a week of intense naval assaults, that many of the Ottoman forts protecting the shoreline had been finally reduced to rubble, and the surrounding sea had been, supposedly, cleared of Ottoman mines. Then a sizable shipment of elite British Royal Marines landed ashore and started to wreak havoc among the Ottoman artillery positions. Nevertheless, by the following month, the Allied assault's progression seemed to stall. So Winston Churchill, who was the first Lord of the Admiralty at the time, pressed for a fresh offensive. He felt that if his attack was implemented, the remaining Ottoman defenses in the area would be quickly overwhelmed, and the Gallipoli Peninsula would fall to the Allies in a matter of days. Churchill even confidently predicted that the nearby Ottoman capital would fall within 14 days, resulting in the Gallipoli campaign finally being won by the Allies, and possibly forcing the Ottomans out of the war for good. British intelligence had also intercepted a German diplomatic telegram that said many of the Ottoman units in the area were seriously short of ammunition and totally demoralized after weeks of fighting. Therefore, on March 18, 1915, the Allies tried to force the issue by sending a large fleet of 18 battleships, along with a number of cruisers and destroyers. What followed was a complete and utter disaster for the Allies as the Ottomans had secretly laid out fresh sea mines in the area and were willing to put up a much stiffer resistance than expected. With mounting losses, the Allies were forced to order a humiliating retreat, while the Turkish defenses received little significant damage. Therefore, the Allies decided that their only course of action was now to launch a full-scale invasion of the Gallipoli Peninsula with a sizable land army in order to neutralize the many Ottoman coastal batteries. So in late April, a large force consisting of British, Australian, and New Zealand troops landed all along the Gallipoli coastline. The problem was that the Allies had badly underestimated the enemy's ability to fight, thinking it would be a relatively easy task to defeat the supposedly inferior Ottoman forces. But the Allies never got much further than just beyond the beaches where they had first landed, making very little progress inland once ashore. Consequently, the Allied invasion quickly turned into a bitter and costly stalemate between the two opposing sides. Characterized by demoralizing trench warfare and futile infantry charges against one another. The Norfolk Regiment of the British Army joined in this brutal chaos in the summer of 1915. Some of the men from this unit were recruited from King George V's royal estate at Sandringham. They were gamekeepers, gardeners, farmhands, and household servants, led by Captain Frank Beck, who, while middle-aged, volunteered to go with his men, feeling a sense of responsibility for them. 
This regiment had a long and distinguished history, having been formed in 1685. It had won its first formal battle honor during the Seven Years' War from 1756 to 1763. The Norfolk Regiment won further battle honors, including one for the Afghanistan War that took place from 1878 to 1880. And in just the first year of World War I, they were awarded with no less than a further seven battle honors. On August 12, 1915, after weeks of heavy fighting on the shoreline of the Gallipoli Peninsula, around 500 soldiers of the Norfolk Regiment, 5th Battalion, were part of an offensive to drive inland around the Suvla Bay, along with several other Allied units. For many years, a legend grew that the battalion charging towards a woodland had vanished into a mysterious cloud or mist, and not one soldier came back. They had simply all disappeared. Nothing more was ever seen or heard of any of them. They charged into the forest and were lost to sight and sound, Sir Ian Hamilton wrote. But what really happened to these men? The 5th Battalion initially pushed forward down a muddy, waterlogged farm track, making their way into enemy-held territory, when suddenly and without warning, they came under relentless gunfire from a nearby Ottoman machine gun emplacement. This managed to wipe out around one-third of their number in just a matter of seconds. The survivors of this onslaught quickly split into two groups, one headed for cover in a nearby abandoned farm and vineyard, while the others made their way to the safety of some cottages a short distance away. The group at the abandoned farm then started to come under constant sniper fire from the adjacent woodland, and soon dead British soldiers started to pile up all around. In the ensuing chaos, most of the regiment's officers were killed, including its commanding officer, Colonel Sir Horace G.P. Beauchamp. War records noted that after the engagement, 16 officers and 250 enlisted men of the 5th Battalion were listed as missing, presumed killed or captured in action. A few weeks after this conflict, the newspapers back home in Britain accurately reported this event, including personal testimonies from some of the survivors of this massacre. But as no bodies could be recovered, the 5th became dramatically known as the Vanished Battalion. However, six months later in January of 1916, it was discovered that Captain Coxon from the 5th Battalion had survived the slaughter. It turned out that he had been badly wounded and was captured by Ottoman soldiers the next day. He was now recovering in an enemy hospital in Constantinople. By all accounts, he was being well treated and was on the verge of a full recovery. This raised the hope among friends and family that some of the missing officers and enlisted men of the 5th Battalion might well be alive and were being held as prisoners of war by the Ottoman Turks. When the war finally ended in 1918 and the Allied prisoners were returned home by the defeated enemy, none of them were from the 5th Battalion apart from Captain Coxon and another officer, 2nd Lieutenant Fox. Despite several further inquiries from the British authorities, the Ottomans categorically stated again and again that all Allied prisoners had been returned and they had no records of any other 5th Battalion soldiers being captured from that area in August of 1915. It was not until the late 1960s that fanciful and incorrect theories started to emerge about the actual fate of these vanished soldiers. Some said that they were captured and brutally executed by the Ottomans, who had a reputation of not keeping prisoners. Another popular theory was put forward by several members of a New Zealand unit that was fighting nearby during that fateful engagement. They claimed to have seen the men of 5th Battalion march down the road towards the enemy and then suddenly becoming engulfed in a mysterious mist, never to be seen again. Some people even theorized outlandishly that this meant that a supernatural or extraterrestrial force had taken them. The truth of the matter is much more down to earth. As in 1919, just a year after the war had ended, a Commonwealth War Grave Registration Unit was allowed back into the area around Suvla Bay, and they recovered a number of bodies, most being from the Norfolk 5th Battalion. Despite only a few being individually identified, their unit insignia could clearly be seen on their tattered uniforms. In fact, of the missing 266 soldiers of the vanished battalion, 180 were eventually recovered from the area. Most of these were found buried together in a ravine, having been placed there by a local farmer shortly after the battle. As for the Gallipoli campaign itself, it dragged on for nearly a year after the Allies finally gave up and withdrew from the peninsula on January 9, 1916. It was widely seen as an Allied defeat, having achieved none of its original goals. 
It resulted in 302,000 Allied troops killed, wounded, captured, or missing. The Ottomans suffered around 250,000 casualties. The chief architect and avid supporter of the whole campaign, First Lord of the Admiralty Winston Churchill, was widely blamed for the campaign's failings. Though later, the Dardanelles Commission, which was organized to investigate the disastrous Gallipoli campaign, concluded that he was in no way personally responsible or to blame for the campaign's many shortcomings. Five Myths About the Romans Myth number one, most gladiator fights were not to the death. One of the most enduring images of ancient Rome is that of a defeated gladiator awaiting his fate, the crowd watching with bated breath to see whether the emperor would decide to be merciful and spare his life with a thumbs up or condemn him to death with a thumbs down. Whilst being a gladiator in ancient Rome was certainly a risky business, with the threat of death or severe injury ever present, it was not quite as dangerous as we often believe. Gladiators were seen as an expensive commodity. They were highly trained fighters who were leased out to provide entertainment, and if they were killed in action, those organizing the games would be forced to pay substantial fees, up to 50 times that of the rental cost. Actual matches to the death were a relatively rare occurrence and may have even required imperial authorization. Gladiatorial training was focused more on how to subdue an opponent than to how to land a killing blow, and there is evidence suggesting that they valued the idea of mercy toward their competitors. Several epitaphs dedicated to men who fell in the arena proudly proclaim that they saved many souls or hurt no one. We also know the career records for several gladiators, such as Flama, whose tomb tells us that he fought 34 times with 21 wins, 9 draws, and 4 losses. Finally, the popular idea that thumbs up meant life and thumbs down death is almost certainly wrong. Roman sources are unclear on the precise gestures used and describe the thumb as being in a variety of positions. However, the most likely interpretation of the evidence suggests that thumbs up actually meant death while a closed fist was a sign for mercy. Myth number two, Nero did not fiddle whilst Rome burnt. The Emperor Nero has gone down as one of history's greatest monsters. To list just a few of the crimes he allegedly committed, he had his mother murdered his first wife executed, kicked the second one to death whilst she was pregnant with his child, and ordered the persecution of Christians. Perhaps the most famous accusation leveled against him, though, is that he fiddled whilst Rome burnt. The incident to which this refers is the Great Fire of Rome, a terrible conflagration that began in mid-July of 64 AD and raged almost continuously for nine days. By the time the flames finally died down, approximately 70% of Rome lay in ruins. There are a few problems with the story, though, not the least of which is that the fiddle would not be invented for another 1,500 years. The historian Tacitus, who provided us with one of the best accounts of the fire, claims that on the evening it broke out, Nero was 35 miles outside of Rome at his villa in Antium, and that he returned to Rome when the flames threatened his own house. In an attempt to help the city's desperate population, Nero opened up the public buildings and even his own gardens as shelters and ensured the price of grain was kept artificially low. The closest that Tacitus comes to the fiddling myth is to tell of a report that supposedly circulated in the immediate aftermath of the fire, stating that Nero took to his private stage and sang the destruction of Troy. Myth number three, Roman statues were not pure white the classical world was much more colorful than we have been led to believe. In museums around the world, the classical galleries are filled with row upon row of pristine white sculptures. For centuries, the accepted truth about Roman and Greek sculpture has been that it was always left undecorated. From the Renaissance onwards, European art has been dominated by this belief in a pure classical aesthetic. That brilliant white marble and the occasional bronze represented the zenith of artistic output of the ancient world. The Greeks, and later the Romans, it was argued, understood that true beauty was found in simplicity and had no need for color in their creations. Unfortunately, for the proponents of this view, there is now overwhelming evidence that they were completely wrong. Fragmentary remains of pigmentation as well as secondary evidence such as a vase that depicts an artist painting a statue provide irrefutable evidence that not only were ancient sculptures colorful, but if anything, they could be considered a little gaudy to modern eyes. Color faded from the ancient Western world in multiple ways, 
sometimes through the gradual erosion that came from being buried underground for several centuries, sometimes from exposure to the elements upon excavation, and other times from the efforts of overzealous archaeologists and curators who believed in preserving the idea of a pure white ancient aesthetic and scrubbed all trace of pigmentation from their finds. Myth number four, Romans didn't always wear togas. Most people, when asked to picture an ancient Roman, will conjure up an image of a toga-clad individual. This is understandable. The use of togas is ubiquitous throughout Roman art. It was supposedly the clothing of choice of the mythological founder, Romulus. The Roman poet Virgil even described the Romans as the gens togata, or the race that wears the toga. However, it's important to remember that through their art, the Romans were presenting an idealized image of themselves. Togas were expensive, heavy, and longer ones required the help of another person to put on. In other words, they were not very practical for everyday wear, especially for those doing manual labor. During the Republic, it's believed that both men and women were able to wear togas. However, as time went on, women came to favor wearing the stola, a type of pleated dress, and the toga came to be viewed as the traditional formal wear of adult males. In fact, a woman found to be an adulteress could be forced to wear a toga to highlight that she no longer demonstrated the virtues necessary to be considered a moral Roman woman. The simple tunic would have been the most common item of clothing for both genders, and wearing the toga was rare enough that the Roman satirist Juvenal was prompted to write, There are many parts of Italy to tell the truth, in which no man puts on the toga until he is dead. Myth number five. The empire was not solely brought down by barbarian raids. This one may be partially true. There were increasing barbarian raids across much of the empire throughout the 4th and 5th centuries, with Rome itself being sacked on three occasions. However, this was not the sole reason for the collapse of the empire. Internal political instability, economic crises, cultural changes, and plagues were all major contributing factors. Between 193 AD and 293 AD, in a period that is now referred to as the Crisis of the 3rd century, there were more than 70 emperors, many of whom were installed by and assassinated by the military. By contrast, in the 178 years prior to the crisis, there had only been 14. The constant changeover in power created huge amounts of instability across the Roman world and saw fragmentation of the empire into several smaller autonomous units. Theodosius was the last emperor to rule over a united Roman Empire. In 395 AD, he divided the empire into eastern and western portions. This proved to be beneficial for the lands that made up the eastern empire, but didn't prevent the deterioration of the western Roman Empire. By the early 5th century, Rome had diminished to the extent that it was no longer considered the administrative capital. The western half of the empire finally collapsed in 476 AD when its last emperor, Romulus Augustulus, was deposed by the barbarian Odoacer. The Eastern Roman Empire, however, continued to flourish for the next thousand years, becoming what we more commonly refer to as the Byzantine Empire, and didn't come to an end until its capital, Constantinople, was conquered by the Ottoman Empire in 1453 AD. Fake News in Wartime War is an especially political subject that takes enormous effort to plan, fund, and put into action. Here are some of the craziest fake news stories about war that were proven to be wrong. Elizabeth McIntosh was a reporter and visionary strategist who used phony news to attack the Japanese during World War II. She was part of the OSS's, or Office of Strategic Services, Morale Operation Branch and Psychological Warfare Laboratory. Her main objective was to use psychological warfare to destroy the morale of Japanese soldiers and civilians by instilling defeatism among them. Releasing false information and bad news was a method used by McIntosh to generally describe the lack of food, soldiers' inferior malfunctioning weapons, military defeats, and other fabricated tales of woe to totally demoralize the Japanese people. She would often intercept letters from Japanese soldiers to their families and change the contents to express these hardships. Elizabeth also used her knowledge of the Asian and Japanese culture to invent fake astrological predictions made up by fictional gurus, which she then published in newspapers. The climax of her misinformation was a fake order that repealed sanctions against Japanese surrenders. Although false, it had a positive impact on both sides. Not only were the Japanese more willing to consider surrendering, but the American troops were less severe in their conduct with enemy units that did lay down their arms. 
Elizabeth's fake news strategy was so successful that in a tribute in 1994 on Memorial Day, President Bill Clinton declared that, quote, she saved lives on both sides, end quote. Elizabeth McIntosh's strategy was a key factor in the Allied victory in World War II, and her ingenious tactics will forever be remembered as an example of how fake news can sometimes be used for good. Fake news also affected Germany during World War II in multiple ways. The most notable example is Sefton Delmer's black propaganda campaign against the Nazis, which included the creation of the fictional broadcaster Der Chef. Sefton Delmer was a British journalist who created Der Chef to demoralize the German people. The broadcasts denounced the corruption of Nazi headquarters by spreading rumors that German soldiers had erroneously received infusions of blood from captured Poles and Slavs who had been infected with syphilis. To add insult to injury, the broadcast also recounted stories about an Italian diplomat in Berlin sleeping around with the wives of German officers. This fake news was designed to create doubt and distrust in the minds of German citizens and soldiers. In addition to Delmer's campaign, the British used other forms of fake news to disrupt and demoralize German forces. This included a radio station presented by a young German called Vicky, who read a mixture of real and fabricated news, as well as a German-language newspaper called Nachrichten für die Truppe, or News for the Troops, which was airdropped to soldiers on the Western Front. All of these tactics were designed to create confusion and dissent among German forces, which contributed to the overall Allied victory. By creating doubt and distrust among German citizens and soldiers, Allied forces spread misinformation, which ultimately affected the Nazi war effort. Less than two months before the United States joined World War II, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt took the stage at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C to give a speech for Navy Day. He knew that with Britain fighting alone against Nazi Germany, his country would need to join in the fight in order to stop the Third Reich. Using Navy Day as a platform to rally the nation, Roosevelt interrupted his speech to hold up a map. I have in my possession a secret map made by Hitler's government, he explained. It is a map of South America and part of Central America as Hitler proposes to reorganize it. The room was shocked. As recently as 1940, only 7% of the populace in the United States supported joining the war. Now, the president was holding up documents that proved Nazi Germany intended on expanding into the Americas. Roosevelt also released the documents that day which showed Hitler's pledge to eliminate all religion throughout the world. As the room erupted into an uproar, reporters were thrown into a frenzy as they competed to get the president's attention. Everyone in the room had guessed that intervention in the war was becoming inevitable. Eagerly listening to the president's words, the public was thoroughly convinced of Germany's evil agenda. The documents unquestionably placed Germany and the United States in opposite corners. Only one thing was kept out of the president's speech. The documents were fake. Both the map and pledge were the work of a Canadian spymaster named William Stevenson and were designed as tools to encourage the United States into joining the war. Stevenson was the head of a British propaganda organization which had offices in the Rockefeller Center, and his sole mission was to drag the United States into the war. Stevenson worked on many similar projects to sway the American public's opinion of the war. After meeting with the head of the FBI, he was named head of MI6 in the United States. This is the Foreign Intelligence Service of the United Kingdom. Their mission statement is Covert Overseas Collection and Analysis of Human Intelligence in Support of the UK's National Security. With the backing of MI6, Stevenson was able to manipulate and weaponize information to create public outrage against Germany. Throughout history, men such as Stevenson have spread misinformation and propaganda to manipulate global affairs. Jim Morrison, famous lead singer for the American rock band The Doors, often expressed the senselessness of war through his songwriting abilities. In songs such as Unknown Soldier, he relates the story of a man going off to war and dying while his family is eating breakfast and watching television. While many people remember the late singer and his legacy as a legendary singer from the 1960s, much less is known about his father, Admiral George Stephen Morrison and his role in getting the United States involved in Vietnam. 
He was the commander of the 3rd Fleet Carrier Division in the Pacific when the destroyers USS Turner Joy and USS Maddox reported they had been attacked by North Vietnamese ships. The two vessels were on a DeSoto patrol, which is an acronym for De Haven Special Operations off Sing Tau, collecting intelligence in hostile waters when they intercepted some communications between North Vietnamese ships. The American sailors believed an attack was imminent, and they watched their sonar equipment eagerly for any signs of movement. Sure enough, the crew received radar and sonar returns of enemy ships and were soon given orders to fire on the North Vietnamese. Word got back to President Johnson of the Vietnamese aggression and the United States issued a statement that retaliation would follow. This incident became known as the Gulf of Tonkin Incident and contributed directly to the United States' decision to engage the North Vietnamese directly. Johnson used this incident to justify America's involvement in the Vietnam War. He, like the sailors on the USS Maddox and USS Turner Joy, believed that the United States had been physically attacked. It was only revealed 40 years later in 2003 that the entire episode had been imagined. There were no North Vietnamese ships close to the DeSoto Patrol. The sailors had simply been jumpy and alone on dark waters. President Johnson's retaliation orders had been built on a fabricated premise. While many still debate whether bad communication or someone purposely misleading the president was to blame, the Gulf of Tonkin incident represents another way in which fake news about war swayed public opinion and influenced foreign policy. Propaganda in war is as old as war itself, whether it's used to inspire soldiers or terrorize the enemy. Misinformation is extremely effective in shaping public perceptions. By using bogus news, some of the most influential figures in history have been able to turn the tide of major wars. William Stevenson, Elizabeth McIntosh, and Sefton Delmer are only a few of the most well-known examples of those who have used this method to manipulate global events. By creating false information or by weaponizing existing data, these individuals have been able to convince the public to rally behind their cause and support their agenda. While fabricating the truth can be used for malicious purposes, it can also be used to help bring about a positive change. The stories of these individuals and their use of fake news to influence war prove that there is more to it than meets the eye. Countries have often created fictitious armies by controlling and deliberately leaking misinformation. So the next time you hear something on the news, be very careful about its authenticity and wonder if someone is trying to hoodwink you.